hear me? Awesome. So we're going to talk about deep learning today. Welcome. And uh, I don't know if you are uh, like myself, but I, I have the unfortunate uh, habit of watching the news. And uh, most recently, this is what I found while reading the news that touches our industry. Uh, disruption of supply chain, um, pandemic, boosting automation and robotics, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, automation and robotics may be being bad news from workers. And uh, you think that's, uh, that's all there is about our industry and uh, that's what our focus of attention is. But really, what... Uh, oops, sorry. Really what uh, has been going on in the industry is uh, much uh, older challenges that uh, have been uh, uh, you know, underlying uh, the manufacturing space for many, many years. Out of COVID is just the last one that came in. But pressure to improve has always been there. Uh, reshoring is a more recent tendency of uh, factories coming back to US and Europe. Increasing SKU offerings, so creating additional complexity for the manufacturing. And all of these challenges cannot be met, uh, most likely with adding people. People are hard to find, and the manufacturing has a waiting workforce. Uh, so the, the, the number of people employed in the sector is, uh, is a diminishing return. Uh, high cost, humans uh, always uh, have a high cost for, for uh, Employers and uh, more humans that will solve the problems of high errors and uh, uh, lack of data logging for, uh, for, the, for the manufacturers. So let's talk about a specific uh, task, which is the task of vision inspection. Of course, we are at the vision show, we all know what this is about. Uh, quality inspection is uh, checking if the product is right or not. And uh, let's uh, look at some numbers here to, to give you some context. The 10 million is the average cost for a food company recall. So they're very expensive problems. Uh, 50 million is the uh, record setting number of vehicles that have been recalled for electronic components defects. Out of this, we have about 350,000 people working in the US in, in uh, 2020 in the quality inspection process, uh, which is a waiting workforce. 47,000 is the projected return, uh, re re uh, projected reduction of, uh, of this workforce in the US. And the 100 million is uh, the projected number of US manufacturing machine vision system to be deployed by 2025. Uh, so it's obvious that the diminishing workforce is being met by adding more and more automation. So that's great, and uh, that's where deep learning comes in. And uh, the brain up there is uh, what I've been working on for about 25 years, at the beginning in academia and now with, uh, with my own software company. And there, are, uh, there is a shared set of uh, problems and solutions that whatever we have in our skull, uh, those 100 million neurons and 250 trillion synapses can do uh, for the manufacturing sector is very, very uh, uh, relevant and very timely uh, to meet the challenges that we just talked about. So for each uh, camera requiring a human operator uh, or for each machine requiring a human operator to understand what's going on, we are moving into a scenario where each one of these cameras and each one of these machines will have their own brain which is fundamentally coming from the R&D that has been done by people like myself for the past 20, 30 years in academia. And this gives the, this camera and this machine the ability to learn just from example, like we do. I show you a chair and I tell you this is a chair, and you're able to learn it very quickly without much supervision. And uh, um, you can do this today in a very lightweight software, so with a software solution that is very simple and very uh, easy to implement for everybody. So what's the difference between traditional machine vision that has been going on for the past uh, 20 years and deep learning, which is a, a, a new world for a very ancient uh, technology called neural networks. When I joined the field, deep learning didn't exist as a name. The, the real name for this sector is actually neural networks. And the, the difference is very simple. In the traditional machine vision or traditional AI case, you use the intelligence of the operator to create a sort of a flow chart based on explicit feature that somebody can program and to say this cap is defective or not. Whereas in traditional machine, in deep learning or neural networks, all the intelligence uh, of, the, uh, of the, um, uh, the, the scientist is encapsulated in the mathematical equation that describes the relationship between these neurons and synapses. And the system can learn by itself to distinguish a healthy cap for a wrong cap. So it's a data-driven approach where uh, the, the solution is able to distinguish out of the visual input uh, just with data. And that's a fundamental difference and that's uh, a, an incredible uh, evolution uh, with respect to uh, how things have been doing, uh, how things have been done in the past uh, 
uh, 20 years. So we started, of course, with uh, uh, inspection 1.0, which is the manual inspection with the operator looking at products. Um, this is expensive to do, inconsistent in quality, uh, inability to identify uh, defects invisible to the human eye, right? You cannot put a person inside a tiny industrial machine, and lack of traceability. So it's always very artisanal. And then there is that, the, you know, the 2.0 is the traditional machine vision, which all of us know pretty much for the past 20 years, requires expertise, is uh, hard to implement, uh, requires time, which uh, is equivalent to requiring money. And then there is the 3.0 version, so it's an ever-expanding province of applicability that the deep learning is, is conquering with respect to traditional machine vision. It has human-like ability uh, to do qualitative judgments, which are really hard to do with traditional machine vision. The ability to be trained just with showing good products, which again is a, is a difference fundamental with respect to traditional machine vision. Some of these products are easy to use, uh, no PhD required and uh, cheaper to set up and operate and uh, have the ability, the potential to do 100% inspection of their products. So that's great, why isn't this everywhere? Well, uh, as I mentioned, not all solutions are easy to use, so um, the, the number of PhD worldwide are, uh, you know, is, is a very thin category, it still takes four years to get a PhD in AI, I can, I can tell you that. Uh, there are no shortcuts, so you have to study. And uh, the, the, out of uh, the 36,000 self-reported AI experts in AI, just a small uh, percentage actually knows what they're doing. Uh, traditional deep learning or traditional neural networks need large quantity of data to be uh, set up and, and deployed. And it's costly. Some of these solutions require GPUs, which you have to compete with data, with a, a Bitcoin miner to, to, to be bought and implemented. So what uh, companies like the one I, I'm leading have been working on uh, is to lower the bar for this technology to be accessible to everybody. So I like to, to think of the metaphor of WordPress. WordPress, uh, if you guys remember the early times of the, of the internet when you had to learn HTML to build and design and deploy a website, what the AI industry needs in manufacturing is something as easy to use as WordPress where everybody uh, with zero expertise in you know, internet uh, designing website, or in this case, building AI, can design, deploy, and maintain this solution without any expertise, lowering the cost barrier, lowering the expertise barrier, and opening up the floodgates for this AI to be applied everywhere. And that's what my company has been doing, my company called Norala, uh, has designed such a product, such WordPress for AI, that uh, has very, very little uh, understanding of AI required, actually zero, where you collect some images, you train the model in seconds, and you deploy and inspect on the production line, uh, interfacing with any DV camera, PLC, any industrial PC, using just tens of images, right? So you can do this in five minutes. We actually have a stand uh, in, in this hall where you can see that being done. Uh, and, and fundamentally, make it quick, easy, and really inexpensive to design and deploy these models in seconds. But uh, I think that the proof here is in the pudding, so let me show you actually what uh, uh, has been done in the field with, uh, with this technology. Um, we have solved uh, with the WordPress for AI um, the, the, the classification of uh, uh, food trays to uh, understand whether this food trays that you buy at the grocery store or you bring in, for instance, in hospital and nursing home have all the right ingredients uh, before being sold. Uh, baby wipes, are they packed correctly before, before they hit the supermarket? Is the dog food contaminated, which is a very hard problem to solve? Is there any contaminants in the dog food? or are the surface of these plastic components okay? So let's talk about uh, the first application, Appetito, which is a, a German, a UK-based food company. Uh, it's a, a, a company that prepares 1.4 million meals per year, so very uh, high number of products, very large number of SKUs, so 1,200 SKU in 14 production lines. The products vary constantly, so it's very hard to design one solution that fits them all, so you have to, to have something that can be trained on-premise on very quickly on new, product, new products. And what they want to do is to reduce complaints, so they have about a thousand complaints per year due to missing food components, and they want to be sure that the tray contains all the right components before being sold. So that, this solution is being fielded and is solving today the problem, they're doing 100% a quality inspection and 100% accuracy in detecting the trays that contain, in fact, the right products. The second uh, 
deploy solution is in a, a couple of dozens of factories uh, worldwide, and it's a Fortune 100 food uh, company that has the problem of detecting contaminants in food. So in, in order to be able to detect a contaminant, you have to have a, a fairly uh, versatile uh, solution. Uh, a contaminant can be anything. It can be the finger of an operator, hopefully not. Uh, it can be a piece of plastic, it can be metal. Uh, so it's an ill pose problem, which is very hard to solve with traditional uh, machine vision because you don't have a recipe. You cannot calculate all the contaminants that can uh, be found in a specific uh, uh, slab of meat. So you have to be able to detect an anomaly, which to a human is really simple. Uh, I look there and I see something that doesn't belong there, I say that's an anomaly. So it's very easy to do with AI, but it's extremely difficult to do with traditional machine vision. So that's a product that is being deployed in over 20 lines today, again solved with machine, with machine vision. And then uh, I'd like just to point out that uh, you can all lower the barrier uh, for, for uh, artificial intelligence to, to get into many applications unless you also make it really inexpensive to do so. And so that uh, this camera, which actually is demonstrated today in the Teradyne Freer, which is a partner of our company, is breaking uh, the barrier of a few hundreds of dollars to uh, have an AI-enabled camera that actually has the AI running directly in the camera without requiring an external uh, processor or an external uh, uh, industrial PC to run. So this is the Firefly DL. DL stands for Deep Learning. It's available today uh, and has a Movidius chip inside, which is a, a neuromorphic chip. Neuromorphic means neuromorphic of the shape of neurons. So it's one of these uh, uh, neuro-inspired processors that uh, enables uh, the, this camera to have AI installed directly in the device for training or for deployment without requiring external computing resources. So this is important, again, to lower the barrier and to enable this camera to enter for instance, inexpensive uh, uh, machines, where the total cost of the machine, the total bill of material, is just a few thousand dollars. You cannot pay three thousand dollars for a camera. You can pay a few hundreds, and that, that this enables this AI to get into these applications, which are uh, today forbidden for the high cost. So I just show you a little bit uh, of, a, of a flavor of where deep learning can be deployed. All of these applications that uh, are shown here on the screen. Uh, our application where either we have uh, uh, already deployment or we have a POC that is leading to a deployment. It's very important to notice that not only different industry from electronics to food, which are radically different in terms of the, the, the type of inspection you're doing, but if we are talking also all the various phases of uh, the production from the intake of raw materials, right? The, the dog food case was uh, uh, raw meat, no raw than this, you can't all the way to production, packaging, and palletization and shipping. So everywhere in the production line, from the intake all the way to the shipping, AI is now either applied or in, in the phase of deployment. And so it's a pervasive technology that is making it everywhere. And uh, at the end of the day, we, we have to be realistic, right? This is all nice and fun, but if it costs too much money, it's impossible to, to go to a customer and uh, you know, propose a, a solution that doesn't meet the cost criteria. So in case of a recall, you know, we have to calculate well, what's the cost of a recall. As, uh, as we've seen uh, for a food product, it's you know, maybe $10, $10 million, uh, but then it takes time, and that's another cost, uh, reputation, and there are other uh, hidden costs uh, for, for, uh, for a recall, for a bad product. And today we can deploy this solution between $10,000 to $200,000, depending on how complicated is the, the, the machinery that has to do the inspection to fundamentally propose something to the manufacturer that have no problem in accepting because they know the cost, they know how much the AI costs to them, and so it's, a, it's really a no-brainer if, if you allow me the term. So just to summarize, we are at the inflection point where the hardware, uh, the software, and the use cases, and the, and the total cost of the solution makes it viable for AI to enter and never leave the field of manufacturing. So there is no return. Uh, AI is here to stay definitely. Powerful deep learning technology, usability by every operator, and economic viability. So, hopefully, I give you uh, a little flavor and happy to take any questions. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Thank you.
questions after? Questions after, yeah. <laughs> so please, no, 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 no. Please. Oh, here. Oh, here. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really like that you pointed out the basics and give an overview to come along with the topic. I really like that as it was within such such presentation. Thank you. So, the room's open for questions. Are there any questions? Yeah? Hello, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering about the neuromorphic chip and the fact that it can train all of the camera is very impressive. Uh, I was curious to know if it can do this uh, training while with inspection or it has to stop before starting the training. <clears throat> yeah, so it, uh, normally you do the training uh, before the inspection. Um, although you know uh, you're pointing out a very interesting feature because you know in our te our technology the technology my company is actually built enables you to do the training while you, you do a classification right so uh, the way humans are able to learn is actually there is a you know there is this distinction in the literature between training and inference right uh, in inference is when you have a trained model that you can infer with or you can understand with whereas training is usually separated in humans this is conflated. Right? So when you're now listening to me, your brain is doing an inference here because you're understanding, hopefully, despite my accent, what I'm saying, but you're also learning what I'm telling you at the same time. Right? So there are a few, very few technologies that enable this to happen in a single tick. When the network is doing one tick, one inference, you can also do the learning. Normally for procedural uh, uh, you know, uh, sanity, we distinguish this, this uh, uh, these two processes because the manufacturer wants to know that they have a golden model that they know they work for that particular product uh, and then they train it uh, and then it's ready to do the inference. So usually we separate this. But it's important to be able to do the training without an industrial PC because you don't need an industrial PC. And so it's a cost that you don't have to eat. Thank you so much for this. Okay, thank you very much. Are there another question? Can you say a little bit more in detail about what's behind this mighty AI processor? So, neuromorphic processors uh, have been uh, studied and developed for many, many years. Uh, actually, if you guys have a cell phone that is the uh, latest generation, uh, you most likely have uh, uh, you know, a, a, a neuromorphic processor. If you have an Apple phone, a Samsung, or a Huawei, or any of those high-end phones, um, as opposed to just having a CPU and, an, and a GPU that have been around for a while, they start to have so-called NPUs or neural processing units uh, that differ from the CPU that is you know, very fast but serial and the GPU which has been de de developed by, you know, for, for essential graphic processing. They differ because they're designed to be most uh, uh, closely mimicking the nature of uh, neural computation, which as, you, as, you, as I explained very quickly, consist of neuron and synapses. So you, you, the, the, the yield of the processor is much higher if you mirror this archi the brain architecture in silicon, and mostly for reducing the power and increasing the speed. So, the, uh, you know, we, uh, just my little company has deployed about 60 million of uh, uh, this, our software copies and cell phones using neuromorphic processors. And now, slowly, because the manufacturing space is, is you know, it's a little slower than other spaces like consumer electronics. Slowly, these new processors are entering uh, the manufacturing sector and they're being embedded in cameras. And once that happens, it's very hard to go back, right? Because uh, it's very useful to have the, this processor directly in the camera without having, as I mentioned, an industrial PC, which has the brain, you know, of a, you know, in, in, a sec in a separate box, right? So you'll see more and more of this camera with this neuromorphic chip being sold in the market in the next few years. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, then thanks again.